Welcome to the University of Hull and this, the fifth lecture to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Department of Politics and International Studies here at the University. My name's Justin Morris and I'm currently head of department. I'm going to say very, very um, few things at this stage, although I will be coming back for a Q&A, which I think uh, the speaker has kindly said he will take some questions toward the end. Without further ado, I shall hand over to my uh, colleague, Professor Lord Norton of Louth. Thank you. Right, well, it's my very pleasant duty to introduce our speaker for this evening, who is indeed the speaker. Um, it's perhaps appropriate that given that this is the 50th anniversary of the Department of Politics and International Studies, that to address us, we do have someone who's a graduate in the subject. Uh, John Burke, who graduated with a degree in government from the University of Essex, he gained a first class honours degree, and Professor Anthony King described him as an outstanding student. Um, he then went on to work in political consultancy and serve on the Council of the London Borough of uh, Lambeth, um, before becoming a special advisor to two cabinet ministers. He entered Parliament in 1997 as the Member of Parliament uh, for Buckingham and made a mark in the House of Commons very quickly. Within two years, he was on the opposition front bench. He joined the Shadow Cabinet in 2001, but left it, uh, resigned from it late in 2002 when he opposed the party leadership's decision to impose a three-line whip to vote against uh, a proposal for gay adoption. He was brought back into the Shadow Cabinet in 2003, but left in 2004, after which he established a reputation as an outstanding backbench member of the House of Commons. In 2005, he received the Channel 4 House Magazine Award for Backbencher of uh, the Year. However, the reason we're here this evening is because in 2009, he was elected the Speaker of the House of Commons and was re-elected at the beginning of this Parliament. He's the 157th holder of the office after Thomas Ungerford was recognised as the first speaker in 1377. However, he's the first speaker, certainly of modern speakers, to speak out on the subject of parliamentary reform, being a great believer in the House of Commons as the body for calling government to account, and at the same time being a great enthusiast for parliamentary outreach, of believing that parliament should engage with the people, particularly uh, young people, and he's been particularly to the fore in ensuring that the Chamber of the House of Commons has been used for such things as youth parliaments. And it's really that combination that brings him here this evening. He has a reputation as an outstanding orator, the Speaker of the House of Commons. He can't speak, give speeches in the Chamber, but we're very fortunate in that he can give speeches outside the Chamber, which is why he's here this evening to speak to us on the subject of parliamentary reform. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce, as our speaker for this evening, the Right Honourable John Burko, MP. Philip, Justin, colleagues, all here present, thank you for the warmth and generosity of those opening words. I'm bound to say that having heard myself introduced, I can hardly wait to hear myself speak. <laughs> and whether you'll feel the same way at the end of my remarks is a matter of legitimate speculation and conjecture. I ought also to say, almost in parenthesis at the outset, that although it is a fact just revealed to you by this distinguished Lord Norton of Louth, of whom more anon, that I am the 157th Speaker of the House of Commons, it is not a fact. Indeed, it is demonstrably untrue when it is regularly said in some of the more downmarket parts of the newspapers that I am, in fact, the shortest man ever to hold <laughs> the office. Now, I should say to you two things on that matter. First of all, there's nothing wrong with being short. We short people, there are bound to be some in the audience on the law of statistical probability, should stick together. Size and height are not everything. But secondly, I've always been intensely relaxed about being short. I've always been short. I'm 49 years old and I remain short. And in view of the known impact of the aging process upon physiognomy, the overwhelming likelihood is that I shall become inexorably and irrevocably shorter still, about which I'm as intensely relaxed as the noble Lord, Lord Mandelson once said that New Labour was intensely relaxed about people getting filthy rich. But Philip, colleagues, I'm not intensely relaxed about the matter of historical 
accuracy. You would, after all, expect the Speaker to have done his research, and I shall not disappoint you. And simply as a matter of fact, this claim is wrong. Sir John Bussey, Speaker of the House of Commons. From 1394 to 1398, Sir John Wenlock, Speaker of the House from 1455 to 1456, and Sir Thomas Tresham, Speaker of the House in 1459, are all believed to have been shorter than I am, <laughs> although I do have to admit that this was true only after all three of them had been beheaded. So there you go. I am extremely grateful to Philip for his introduction. And as I'm talking about Parliament and reform, and my particular title is actually the other way around, as it happens, reform and Parliament, the possibility of and the need for, there is a particular piquancy about the fact that two of Hull's members of Parliament, two of my colleagues, are here this evening. And I'm absolutely delighted that they Ah, Diana Johnson, Member of Parliament for where we are, for the constituency of Hull North, has served in the House since 2005, so I've known her for that seven-year period. And she is as assiduous and articulate and regular contributor on the floor of the House in pursuit of her principles on behalf of her constituents as any constituency could hope or expect to see. So the Speaker doesn't advise people how to vote, that's a matter for you, but I'm simply saying that, as a matter of fact, that is the observable reality for me in the chair day after day. And she's more recently been joined at the last election in Hull East by Carl Turner, who I suspect made a very good living as an extremely effective advocate in the courts before he came to Parliament. And he is now deploying those skills of debate and awkwardness, which he deployed on behalf of his clients in the courts, on behalf of his constituents in the Commons. He is a formidable addition to our team, and it's great to see him here tonight. The third of the trio, as I see it, is Alan Johnson, and I know that neither Diane nor, neither Diana nor uh, indeed, Carl will take offence when I say that actually, in a sense, Alan is the one that I know best, simply because I've known him longest and I worked closely with Alan Johnson when he was Secretary of State for Health and Ed Balls was Secretary of State for Children, Schools and Families on the subject of speech and language services for children and young people. I'd always got on well with Alan Johnson anyway but it was a particularly rewarding experience working with and reporting to him on that matter in the course of the last government in which as you know Alan was a big player. He was a very big hitter in the last government. He is in my view from everything I see and hear of him, a terrific Member of Parliament. And he also happens to be one of the nicest people in politics. Alan can't be here tonight because he presides over a children's charity which has a big event in London. I know he interacts with the university a great deal, but we exchanged letters about tonight's event and then I bumped into him by chance or design at the railway station and he sent his good wishes to all present. It is great to be here and to be part of the celebration surrounding the 50th anniversary of the Department of Politics at Hull University, a body which frankly and deservedly has a fantastic academic reputation, both in this country and internationally. As has been referenced by Philip, my own alma mater, a Latin term for a place where one once drank too much, Essex University will reach this milestone in 2014 and it also, if I may say so, has a wonderful department of government from which I myself enormously benefited. Perhaps, colleagues, because of that link, I feel particularly at home at this institution and speaking before this audience. It is also, however, the 20th anniversary this year of Philip Norton assuming the role of Director of the Centre for Legislative Studies at Hull and Philip has been its driving force ever since. It is my privilege to salute Philip personally on this occasion for a number of reasons. First, when I studied government at Essex in the mid-1980s, I hugely enjoyed reading Philip's tome, The Commons in Perspective, published, if memory serves me, in 1981. Secondly, my undergraduate dissertation was on the subject of backbench dissent. 
Philip's study of rebellion under the Heath government was an invaluable guide to my own more humble project and perhaps a manual for my subsequent displays of stubborn independence as a parliamentarian. Thirdly, because his influence over my thinking about reform and parliament will become evident tonight. I have no hesitation, ladies and gentlemen, in asserting publicly that Philip has been the leading scholar of parliament of his generation, not only in Britain, but probably intergalactically, and that, almost as important, he has been a leading enthusiast for Parliament as well and has contributed mightily to the House of Lords since his elevation to the Second Chamber some 14 years ago. Philip very kindly agreed to participate in a lecture series on 20th century parliamentarians that I organised at Speaker's House last year. He gave a superb lecture on Enoch Powell, and I am honoured to be able tonight to reciprocate. In addressing the question of reform and parliament this evening, I intend to cover three distinct areas. First, in order to set the scene and to provide some intellectual foundations for what I am about to say, I want to cite a number of key observations about parliament and politics, which Philip has articulated a number of times in his various works, including in his most recent edition of the British Polity, still on sale at most good bookshops. From there, I want to argue that the internal reform of the House of Commons is not merely possible, but highly desirable, and to illustrate this by what has been achieved in the past three years, predominantly through the work of the Reform Committee of the House of Commons, more commonly known as the Wright Committee, after its chair, Tony Wright. Finally, I want to offer some thoughts about the one major outstanding piece of reform which flowed from that committee, which is due to be tackled in the next 15 months, namely the creation of a new House Business Committee, and to explain why I think it has the potential to be an immensely significant innovation. In doing so, I shall make some suggestions as to the form which that committee might take. Let us start, however, with the principles upon which parliamentary reform should be based. Without wishing unduly to embarrass Philip, I will mention four of his academic arguments which I think we would be wise wholeheartedly to embrace. The first consists of the character of politics itself. The first paragraph of the first page of the first chapter in the British polity, which, by the way, doesn't mean that I didn't read beyond there, I most certainly <laughs> did, is extremely instructive. It reads as follows. Continuity and change are features of every political system. What makes each system significant is the nature and extent of that change. Some systems are characterised by rapid and sometimes revolutionary change. Others are noted for continuity with past experience and structures. The task of the student of politics is to discern the distinctive features of that continuity and change, to generate concepts and, if possible, to construct models and theories that will aid understanding of and serve to explain those distinctive features and the relationships among them. These are sound sentences. From them, I would argue that change far from being a threat or a curious novelty to the House of Commons, is natural and essential to its continuity. The second Nortonism relates to the character of British life more broadly. Philip notes the division made by Giovanni Sartori, who distinguished two approaches to problem solving, the empirical and the rational. The empirical, to simplify somewhat, is grounded in the practical. The rational is rooted in the theoretical. Philip explains that Britain is normally regarded as having a political culture which tends strongly towards the empirical end of the spectrum and then travels further asserting, and I quote, it is my contention that this approach is most marked in the British case and that it constitutes the most significant aspect of British political culture, unquote. This is, once again, a persuasive contention. If so, then 
the three most important words which those who want to champion the reform of Parliament have to ask are, will it work? Thirdly, Philip concedes both in his Parliament in British politics and in the British polity that, and I quote, legislatures are in decline, unquote, or more subtly, and I quote again, debate about parliamentary reform has proceeded largely on the basis that Parliament has lost power, unquote. As you would expect from Philip, this is a more sophisticated analysis than a private Fraser critique that the House of Commons is doomed, doomed, I tell you. Philip points out that this accusation has been made for many decades, is often heard internationally, with the notable exception of the United States, and that it depends heavily on the decision-making or pluralist view of politics rather than on the institutional outlook. In other words, whether policy is made by Parliament and imposed on the executive rather than made through Parliament, but mostly at the behest of an executive. Despite these qualifications, he concludes that the perception of a loss of power is out there. I agree with that conclusion and believe that for this perception to change, there has to be a change in substance. Parliament must be seen to take action to reclaim its political authority. Finally, Lord Norton identifies two distinct camps of parliamentary reformers. One collection of radicals believes that only external action via seismic constitutional change will be enough to make the House of Commons a more relevant institution. Anything less than this would be, as the professor puts it, and I quote, no more than tinkering with the problem and will not be sufficient to limit a powerful government securing a majority of the House of Commons, unquote. Another canon of reformers, by contrast, while not necessarily hostile to external measures, has rather more confidence in internal reform. Or, as Philip writes, and I quote, this is premised on the belief that changes within the House can enable it to fulfil more effectively the functions ascribed to it, unquote. I concur with this analysis, and my remarks today will be delivered from the internal reform pulpit. I am not necessarily hostile to external action, although as speaker I must and I will avoid entering that potentially partisan minefield. But I do think that, to quote Philip one final time, I promise, internal reform can be both achievable and effective. These then are the central arguments on which I will base the rest of my case this evening. Change is natural, desirable and essential to continuity. The most effective reforms in British politics are anchored in practicality. Will it work? There is a widespread perception that Parliament has been in decline, which, even if not entirely accurate, has enough truth to it to make tackling it a matter of some urgency. It is entirely possible to make substantial progress by the internal reform of Parliament. I will now set out what has been secured by the internal reform of the House of Commons over the past three years. This is very largely, colleagues, the result of the work of the Reform Committee of the House of Commons, established in 2009 in the aftermath of the expenses scandal and placed under the leadership of Tony Wright MP. Its recommendations were accepted by the House in a series of landmark votes in March 2010, and most of them, but as we shall see, not quite all, have subsequently been adopted and implemented in the past two years. Before I do this, I would like to make a brief detour to identify another example of reform, if for no other reason than that it is the one which I have personally advanced from within my quite limited ability to effect change unilaterally. There is a special weapon in the parliamentary arsenal known as the Urgent Question, capital U, capital Q. It is a device which allows any member of parliament to ask the speaker to summon a minister to the house at really very little notice to answer a matter of importance 
which has emerged suddenly or in the time that has elapsed since the House was last sitting. The urgent question had almost disappeared without trace in the first decade or so of this century. It was in danger of having the likes of Philip Norton read the last rites over it. Despite its obvious potential for allowing the legislature an immediate extra degree of scrutiny over the executive, it had become a rarity, probably because ministers and certainly their departments had precious little enthusiasm for it. Only two of them were granted in the 12 months before I became Speaker. I have been determined to reinvent the mechanism of the urgent question, to allow the House the chance to interrogate the executive in a more timely and forensic fashion. I have permitted 89 urgent questions since becoming Speaker in June 2009. Among its many other virtues is the fact that the urgent question means that burning issues are being dealt with in the chamber of the House of Commons and that the media are obliged to report this. I feel strongly that this has been a positive change for the House and that it alone shows that internal reform in the House is not the hopeless cause which some will wrongly claim. The same must be said for the work of the Reform Committee of the House of Commons, which I will refer to as the Right Committee, or just Right, from here on in. This ad hoc select committee was created in the crisis atmosphere which pervaded Westminster after the expenses scandal struck. Although there was no direct relationship between the political authority of MPs and the likes of bath plugs and duck houses, there was a strong sense that the increased marginalisation of Parliament and parliamentarians had contributed to a climate in which the abuse of expenses had sometimes occurred, and that the institutional rehabilitation of the House required more, much more, than the creation of an independent machinery for the supervision of future expenses, which machinery has since been established. This was more than a case of ensuring that the office stationery, in other words, was not being taken home at the end of the working day. The far more searching question was, what was the office for in the first place? The role of the backbench MP especially had become an especially dispiriting one. Especially, and I think, increasingly dispiriting one. There were many who thought that the right committee would never reach anything like a consensus on its recommendations. There were others who believed that it might produce a coherent final report, but that it would not be in the interest of either the government or the opposition front bench to permit such proposals to come to the floor of the House for a series of votes, while there were others willing to accept that such votes might occur, but who doubted whether backbench MPs had the stomach to endorse them. There were even a few who believed that all of these barriers might be crossed, but that somehow the mysterious forces of darkness in the Palace of Westminster would ensure that the measures would never actually be implemented. Much as the United States Congress enacted legislation in 1975 to prepare that nation for metrification within a decade, a process which never quite materialized. The cynics and sceptics were, this time, truly routed after some pretty robust behind-the-scenes negotiations, the details of which will have to await the memoirs of all concerned. The right proposals were put to the House on March the 4th, 2010, and almost all of them were adopted handsomely. I will not take even this learned audience through all of the right recommendations. I want instead to focus on two crucial components now and then move on to a final element later. The first of these concerns departmental select committees. Colleagues, the House has had select committees of various sorts for centuries. It was only in 1979, however, that there emerged a structure 
of departmental select committees designed to shadow the work of Whitehall empires. This was rightly seen at the time as an extremely significant development, and over the next three decades, these select committees engaged in sterling activity. But they were always, I put it to you, limited, both in perception and in practice, by the reality that the whips on both sides had a considerable influence as to who chaired and who sat on them. It looked as if those charged with scrutinising the executive were being chosen by the hired agents of the executive. That impression was often unfair, but to be honest, it was an institutional handicap. The Wright Committee argued, and the House accepted, that among a number of other changes designed to make select committees more effective, the chairs of them should be elected by secret ballot across the whole House, and the individual members of those select committees should be chosen by the votes of their party colleagues. This happened for the first time in 2010. It has been a liberating experience. The independence of select committees is now indisputable, and the prominence achieved by, for example, the Treasury Select Committee in winning a veto over the composition of the leadership at the Office of Budget Responsibility, or the Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee in their forensic investigation of the News International phone hacking saga, speaks volumes about the significance of what has happened. Other examples of select committees flexing their enhanced muscles might have secured less publicity, but ministers and officials are well aware that something profound has changed. Three cheers for that. The second innovation concerns that aspect of the parliamentary timetable long referred to as backbench time, but which for a very long period has been out of the effective control of backbench members of parliament. The right committee contended forcefully that this was wrong as a matter of principle and that an elected backbench business committee should be established to oversee these hours within the House of Commons. This also took place in 2010 and it has been a spectacular success. It has meant that subjects which not only the government of the day but the opposition front bench if it is frank, would rather not see discussed in public, have been vigorously debated. It is utterly inconceivable, for example, that a deliberation and a vote on whether or not there should be a referendum on Britain's continued membership of the European Union would have been held under the old system. MPs find themselves arguing about issues which they are passionately interested in and which the public is often passionate about as well. The Backbench Business Committee has thus not only revived the House as an institution, it has helped it to connect more effectively with the country at large. This is to be loudly applauded. So far, so good. There is nevertheless one further piece of the right jigsaw which has yet to be put in place, but which I am confident will be seen shortly. It is one of great potential value. For more than a century, much of the parliamentary timetable has been considered to be government time and has been commanded exclusively by the government business managers, the whips, sometimes in cooperation and coordination with their opposite numbers on the opposition front bench and in a manner which has made the smoke-filled room look like a model of modern political openness. The Wright Committee insisted that this arrangement needed to change and should be replaced after a modest period by the creation of a full House Business Committee to oversee this crucial part of the parliamentary schedule instead. The House endorsed this view in 2010, but also agreed that the Backbench Business Committee should be established first. This accord was further entrenched by the Conservative Liberal Democrat Coalition Agreement reached after the inconclusive general election in May 2010, which stated explicitly that a House Business Committee would come into being during the third year of this Parliament, a date which is 
approaching rapidly. I am pleased to report that both Sir George Young, the leader of the House of Commons, and David Heath, his Liberal Democrat deputy, have repeated those assurances once again to MPs in the chamber in the closing months of last year. That leaves the question of how the House Business Committee should be structured and what, in slightly more detail, it should look like. As this will be the major challenge for the reform of Parliament this side of the next general election, I want to devote the remainder of my remarks tonight to these matters. The Right Committee provides us with a helpful steer on the main architectural question. It considered four possible models for a House Business Committee. The first was a single business committee deciding all business, in effect rendering a backbench business committee redundant. While this had the advantage of simplicity, international experience and to a lesser extent the Scottish Parliament convinced Right that any backbench involvement in such a business committee would not be very significant. It was concluded that, and I quote, if such a committee was created and then dominated by the whips, the House would have gained no more ownership of backbench business than it has at present, unquote. This option was therefore emphatically rejected. The second concept was not to bother with a new House business committee at all, but just to bolt on a backbench business committee to the existing system of and I quote, the usual channels, which means the whip's office of government and opposition. This would again seem a relatively simple and theoretically clean exercise. It would mean, however, as the right team swiftly surmised, that there would be, and I quote, no real sense of house ownership of the ministerial part of the agenda and no backbench challenge to it before the agenda was put to the house, unquote. Furthermore, and I quote again, from right, a backbench business committee created in these circumstances might not survive long, unquote. This option, too, was rejected by the committee. The third item on the menu was a House business committee with two subcommittees. One of these would deal with government business and the other would concentrate on the backbench schedule. Although perfectly rational, the deep suspicion was that backbench MPs would again be cut out of any meaningful discussion about government business time where decisions would be reached within its own subcommittee. That option, too, was discarded. As a result, Wright came down firmly, and I quote, our preferred solution is to have two committees. The task of assembling a draft agenda to be put to the House should be undertaken by a unified House business committee comprised of representatives of all parts of the House with a direct interest. Backbenchers, government and opposition. This would be supplemented by an institutionally independent backbench business committee. I completely agree with that conclusion. I also note how closely it fits with Norton's nostrum, namely that empiricism is the moving spirit in British political and national life. The creation of two committees was in many ways the most messy of the options which Wright considered. I doubt whether it is the outcome upon which our friends in France would ever have settled. Yet the committee looked beyond abstract theory and asked about practicalities. Will it work? And decided that what might appear to be the more complicated arrangement was the far better one. The essential architecture of the new House Business Committee should be the right proposal. What about the floors, walls and ceilings? Once again, will it work should be our template. It seems to me that there are three distinct reforms to consider, and it might be shrewd to do this in a phased fashion, allowing a few months to pass between them before we settle on the final version of a House Business Committee, one that will then endure. Those issues, colleagues, are transparency, composition, and output. First, on transparency, light needs to be shone on current arrangements as we make the transition to a very different system. Transparency can have a dramatic effect simply by itself, as the new expenses system testifies, formalising the informal, 
rendering it public, publishing its conclusions. These are essential initial steps. From there, we can move secondly to the composition of the House Business Committee as created. It seems to me that there are six fundamental principles here which should be adopted. First, the government should have a majority, but not a monopoly on the business committee. It would be somewhat ludicrous if a single party, or as now a combination of parties, controlled a majority of the seats in the House of Commons, but could not move legislation beyond first base because it was outvoted in the committee which scheduled business. This would also, to be candid, be a deeply undemocratic outcome. The government is entitled to have legislation scheduled so that it will be approved or not, at the third reading stage in a reasonable manner. The House, however, should have the right to ask that certain measures receive more scrutiny than the norm because of the nature and implications of that legislation. This balance, particularly at the pivotal report stage before third reading, has not always been struck in the past. Just to give you a feel for the scale of the problem, since 2005, there have been 143 bills subject to a programme order, that is, a schedule for consideration, a timetable for debate. At the report stages of those bills, 283 groups of amendments have not been reached in debate because time has run out an average of almost exactly two groups per bill. So it is reasonable, I think, to seek a better balance between speed and scrutiny. That is what I mean by a majority, but not a monopoly position for the government on the business committee. Second, the business committee should be chaired by an independent and preferably impartial individual. This is a vital step to securing the confidence of the whole house in it. The right committee suggested that the senior deputy speaker, the chairman of Ways and Means, currently Lindsay Hoyle, the member of parliament for Chorley, might be the right person for that post, and this strikes me as a sensible proposition. Third, there should be a backbench component to the business committee. At a minimum, and as a start, the chair of the House Backbench Business Committee should serve, but depending on the size of the committee, other backbenchers, as well as the chair of the Backbench Business Committee, might also be represented. Fourth, it is important that the so-called minor parties collectively have a voice on the committee. They should not be pushed to the fringes of parliamentary opportunities. Fifth, as it would be desirable to link the work of select committees to the chamber more emphatically, there is a strong case for a representative of the select committees, possibly the chair of the liaison committee, the select committee chair's forum. That person is currently the member for Berwick-upon-Tweed, Sir Alan Beath, to be included on the business committee as well. Sixth, perhaps not during this parliament, but at the outset of the next one, there is a strong case for considering that some members of the business committee, logically the backbench ones, should be elected by the whole house so they can speak with that mandate. The final issue which needs to be addressed is the output of the house business committee. With transparency introduced and then the composition of the committee settled, the aim of the business committee should be to produce a firm schedule for business in the week ahead and a more tentative one for the week afterwards, which the whole House can accept, amend, or in exceptionally rare circumstances, send back to the drawing board in its entirety. For the avoidance of doubt, at the risk of overemphasis, you will appreciate no such opportunity exists at present. There is a statement to the House each Thursday at what we call business question of the intended business for the following week, but that is the government's offering on the table. It isn't votable on, it isn't amendable, it isn't send backable. So this would be a sharp and defining change in our parliamentary arrangements. If we proceed in a practical and pragmatic manner, making sure that we get each step of the voyage right, then by the end of this parliament, I think we can achieve a full functioning House Business Committee, which will be responsible to the whole House, not just to ministers. 
This would be a monumental achievement, which absolutely nobody, myself included, would have thought was possible, perhaps in our lifetimes, a matter of three short years ago. It is, to my mind, a prize well worth obtaining, and it is central to the reform of Parliament and the restoration of the House of Commons in national politics and to national life more broadly. If you would like an example of how all this can occur and what benefits it can bring, let me point you in the direction of Wellington. My counterpart there, I wasn't referring, by the way, to the Duke of, uh, my counterpart there, Dr Lockwood Smith, the Speaker of the New Zealand Parliament, made a speech last month in which he reflected on the relatively recent innovation of a business committee in that legislature. In it, he noted that formality was, and I quote, making the process a great deal more open and transparent than the inter-party negotiations that have characterised the management of the government's business in the past, unquote. He added how salutary it was that all sides knew that the results of their talks would be published on the website. He observed that while, and I quote, the government's ability to order its business remains largely intact, unquote, there are, and I quote, greater incentives for the government to go to the business committee and negotiate the passage of its bills, unquote. Nor has this been a mere fine-tuning or tinkering with a schedule. Dr Lockwood Smith insisted that, and I quote, the business committee now has greater powers to determine extra sittings for government business and also to take a greater role in determining the length, nature and timing of debates in the House, unquote. The government could not railroad its proposals through, but instead, and I quote, must build the support of other parties, unquote. The ultimate outcome, he argued, was not only a better balance between the executive and the legislature, but better legislation. This does not strike me as surprising. Inadequate scrutiny can hardly lead to stellar laws. I think that New Zealand is an entirely credible role model for the UK Parliament to emulate. I started this address with a tribute to one great authority on Parliament, Lord Norton. I would like to end it with reference to another, very different one, the late Robin Cook. Robin was a House of Commons man to his fingertips. He appreciated its strengths and he understood its weaknesses. And on the issue which I have sought to identify tonight, he knew where he stood. And as so often, he hit the nail squarely on the head. In his book, which I have read and I warmly commend to you, The Point of Departure, published shortly after he left government and his time as a distinguished leader of the House of Commons still fresh in his mind, Robin wrote, quote, the balance of power between the executive and parliament will remain too firmly tilted in favour of government until MPs win a say on the agenda of their proceedings through some form of collective business committee, unquote. Robin Cook was right. We can achieve that end. It will work if we advance in the right way. All friends of Parliament should support that ambition. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for listening. To me. <laughs> oh, the more the merrier, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, um, the speaker has kindly agreed to take questions. I said 10 to 15 minutes, he said the more the merrier. Um, we do have microphones, but I'm hoping that the acoustics of this room are such that I don't have to go charging up and down the staircase with a roving microphone. I realise that might be amusing to you, but I wouldn't, <laughs> it, wouldn't, it wouldn't help me, I don't think. Um, so let's try it without the microphones, and if we do, if we do need a microphone, then um, I shall fall back on plan B. Uh, Who would like to ask any, uh, any Jack first? Can I preface my question with two Right. Uh, but you're 
the real osmosis. But the yeah. other point is that you rightly gave tremendous emphasis to the role of Tony Wright, and he was a political scientist, and I think yes. it illustrates the fact that people who have studied a subject like you have a capacity to do something not merely in terms of praising existing institutions or overturning them, but to, to reform them. My question really is, in the light of your remark, I think, perfectly right, directly about the change of the institutions, how much will this contribute to what I think is an absolutely vital change, which is that members of Parliament do not think of themselves as people whose <coughs> career depends on becoming ministers, that if they see themselves as making as vital and important career, say, as members of a select committee, that that will really make these reforms fully effective. As long as most members of parliament see themselves as only being fulfilled when they become ministers, I think they will always be inhibited in taking full advantage of the opportunities which you make. Well, Professor Haywood, I entirely agree with that. Thank you, by the way, for what you said about the new Vice-Chancellor of Essex University, whom I'm hoping to meet very soon. I knew his predecessor well. I do believe that it will make a decisive difference. Look, there are already colleagues in the House of Commons, backbench members, who take their responsibilities as backbenchers very seriously. I mentioned that Diana and Carl are already rather notable examples of members of parliament who use the chamber and the opportunities that the House presents to further their principles and causes dear to them and their constituents. But the truth of the matter is that the process is heavily run by the government of the day, and there isn't at the moment much, there's much more than there was, but there isn't yet enough, let's put it that way, of an institutional architecture to assert parliament as opposed to an institutional architecture to facilitate the assertion of government. And that's why I think that these changes are needed. And I think that just as we've now got a backbench business committee, and Natasha Engel, it's extremely effective and indefatigable chair, has made a name for herself as chair of the backbench business committee, and I don't know, but probably wouldn't particularly want, if her party were in power at the moment, to be a minister. I think she'd probably feel that as compared with being a very junior minister, being chair of the backbench business committee is a really pivotal role. You can make a real difference. We need more of that. Chairs of select committees being elected means that they've got more respect, they've got more authority, they've got more independence, they've got more credibility. And, and also, you know, let me not humbug you about it, in recognition for some years of the fact that we thought select committee chairs were important, we decided to pay them. And, you know, some people might criticise that, but it, it was a way of saying, look, you are actually undertaking official duties, and it shouldn't just be done on the sort of old boy principle, you're a jolly good chap and you're serving the house, and frankly good of you to do so, but of course you're not going to do so for any remuneration at all. No, it's a role, it involves a very considerable additional workload to be the chair of a select committee. So for years we've paid them, but they didn't have the authority that results from election. And now they do. And they've got more independence. The, the whips can't lean on them. They're not, whips aren't supposed to lean on them, but whips used to lean on them, of course, because they'd say, look, we basically got you in. We appointed you. And that doesn't now apply. So already they've got great authority. I think if you have a House business committee and people standing for election to it and pursuing particular themes on it about the importance of allocating more time for certain types of legislation or whatever, they will become big parliamentary players, rather as chairs of, for all the other objections to the system and arguments about whether it's broken in the United States, chairs of key committees in Congress are very big political hitters, ladies and gentlemen. They are really very important figures in the House of Representatives, most notably. So I think it will play a big role. And I've always said that it's a pity if people think that the only purpose of being in politics is to be a minister. I remember, I think, reading recently something where Patrick Gordon Walker, who was quite a prominent figure, very prominent figure in the Labour Party in the sort of 50s and 60s. Patrick Gordon Walker allegedly said at one time, I mean, won't be the only person to have said it, there's absolutely no point in going into politics unless you wish to be prime minister. 
And it's funny, because I've heard that said many times, and I've always thought that was wrong. I've always rejected that idea. The idea that the only purpose of going into Parliament is to end up with the top position. I mean, what a nonsense. There are all sorts of people who might think, no, I can contribute. I have principles, a cause, an objective to achieve, or even simply a, a constituency that I think I'm particularly well-placed to represent effectively. But I've no desire to hold the most glittering prize. And look, when I was, my problem was that when I was on the back bench, I always wanted to be on the front. And when I was on the front, I always wanted to be on the back. <laughs> and ultimately, my wife said to me, you know, honey, this is a recipe for unhappiness. You know, you've got to decide what you want to do. And eventually, I came to the conclusion that I didn't want to be a minister, and in any case, was most unlikely to be asked to be a minister. I always myself enjoyed a relationship with my whips characterized by trust and understanding. And I didn't trust them, and they didn't understand me. <laughs> And so I thought, well, this isn't going to work, you know. But I admit, I wanted to do something else. I'd always been passionate about Parliament. And I thought, well, one day, you know, if the chance to stand for Speaker comes up, I'll have a go at it. And, you know, you get somebody to ask around, because you don't want to be humiliated, and to discover whether you're going to have any support at all. And various people on different sides of the House asked around, and it was reported back to me, John, you've got a real chance. Have a go. But I agree with you, Jack. There are lots of things you can do in Parliament. Being a minister is one of them. It's not to be sniffed at. Great privilege to serve in a government. There are lots of other things people can do. And, you know, I think of some of the really great MPs, and Tony Bright was one of them. And, and he's, I think, living proof of that. Sorry, I'll try to give rather briefer answers uh, from now. Jeff, the white shirt. Yeah, it's just the mm. I think earlier of that yes, there's yes, yes. One of yes. the main criticisms of yes, yes is that when ministers get an open question, they too often avoid answering it. Yeah. What do I think to the idea, in the light of ministers often, or prime ministers not answering difficult questions, <laughs> the speaker should be com empowered to compel ministers or the prime minister to answer questions? I don't uh, subscribe to that view, but I will explain why. I'm not going to duck your question. I will answer it. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea, in light of the content of the question. I don't think that the speaker should be so empowered, and I'll tell you why. It is a subtle but a very discernible difference if you have a player rather than a referee. My role is to be the referee or the umpire. If I start interrupting and saying, oh, oh, order, I'm sorry, but the Prime Minister is not answering the question. I must ask him to come back to the very specific point he's been asked. I want him to answer that point. I am then getting in the position of being an evaluator. I'm making a judgment. And I don't think the speaker should do that. So I absolutely accept that a lot of people, I often get letters about this, feel frustrated. And they feel, oh, you know, even, dare I say it, you know, people in one's own family, my own mother, will, now and again will phone up and say, well, I think it was very wrong. You know, the minister <laughs> wasn't answering the question. And I said, no, no, I understand that. But it's not for me to intercede. And what's more, what I would say to you is if you can tell that a minister under whichever government or prime minister under whichever government isn't answering the question, you can bet your bottom dollar, although I'm sure a student of the University of Powell, you are forensically bright, and quite a lot of other people can probably tell that too. And they must form their own judgment. So no, what I do is I intervene if people use unparliamentary language, which happens quite a bit. It happened yesterday. I'm sorry to say, even at Prime Minister's Questions, we do have conventions in the House which are not pointless. They're partly for reasons of courtesy and so on. We don't, for example, talk about you, you, you. We don't do that in the House. It's against the rules. We speak through the chair, which I think, on the whole, aids civility, courtesy. But otherwise, I would intervene only if somebody, as I say, used unparliamentary language or was too long. But no, people must make their judgment. Is the question being answered or is it being ducked? OK, let me go over this way. Yes, sir. Um, for reform to be successful, uh, fair representation is needed. Uh, despite the passage of the Equalities Act, um, representation of disabled people in Parliament is around 0.2%, with 20% of people in um, society now self-defining as disabled. How will you uh, work to ensure fair representation? Well, first of all, I accept the obligation to do much more to achieve fair representation. There has been some improvement on this front, just as Parliament has gradually become a bit more representative, more widely, of modern Britain, the proportion of our members from the BME communities has increased. The number of openly gay or lesbian members of Parliament we have is higher than before. 
and certainly we got far more female members of parliament than before, though still statistically nothing like their proportion of the population. We do need to do more to get disabled people into parliament. The Speaker's Conference on Parliamentary Representation was asked to look at this very specific question. It was asked by Gordon Brown in the last parliament. Michael Martin chaired it as Speaker, and then I took over from him as Chairman of it when I became Speaker. And we produced a report in, I think, January or February 2010, many of the recommendations of which have been implemented, but a good many of which have not. And there's a certain amount for government to do but there's also quite a bit for the political parties to do to try to make life more manageable and the prospect of a parliamentary opportunity more meaningful and realistic for people with disabilities. Now, it may be that there are physical changes, well, there certainly are, that we can and need to make in the House of Commons. And that's difficult because it's an ancient institution with a magnificent sort of architecture, but a rather, it's rather disability unfriendly. And we need to, to do things to make it easier and better. Um, and we're trying with Anne Begg, who was the effective day-to-day -day leader of the conference, who is herself wheelchair-bound, to do that. But the political parties have got to do more to try to ensure that attitudes are changed within their parties and that, where necessary, additional resources are offered to help people with disability. I was rather shocked, I must tell you, we really must do more to change attitudes, when Kate Green, Member of Parliament for, I think, Stretford and Umston, Labour member, mentioned to me, and she then, uh, at my request, wrote to me, said that she'd held quite an important meeting in her constituency with a lot of um, people who were deaf or hard of hearing, and she paid for the services of um, uh, a hearing loop, uh, if I remember rightly, but also I think she paid for some personnel to, uh, for lip reading services and so on. And naturally, as this was a public duty, she claimed the cost, which was not an insignificant cost, through IPSA on expenses, which, to be fair, was paid. But there was a great bulk of letters sent to the local paper, possibly orchestrated, I don't know, by her political opponents, complaining bitterly and saying what a scandal it was and how dare she incur public expense in order to run this meeting effectively. And I was absolutely shocked by this. I said to her, well, if you write to me, I'll write back to you in very forceful terms, saying it was absolutely justified and legitimate, and I would encourage any member to use resources publicly available for that purpose. And anyway, we had that exchange, and I think the, the row damped down in her constituency, but I thought, gosh, isn't it extraordinary how, you know, so toxic is the expenses issue that people sometimes just don't bother to reflect about, about what they're saying. I mean, that was absolutely a legitimate use of public resources. I'm conscious of time, but I can also okay. see lots of hands, so I'm going to take okay. clusters of questions. Okay. The gentleman in the, yeah, in the my, my blue. My name's Ken Reid. I'm a political advisor of UTD in Northern Ireland. We're also a graduate of this great university. And to your Lord, I'm coming from when I ask this question, Speaker. Do you worry with growing devolution that Westminster is becoming a parliament purely for the English? And how do you make it more relevant to Scotland and Wales, and more particularly in my case, Northern Ireland? Let me take a couple of other questions. Yes, madam. Um, I know that you're a great supporter of the UK Youth Parliament, and I was wondering um, what your personal views were on whether or not you would vote against a sitting House of Commons. And I'll take one more. Well, sir. As you know, Mr. Speaker, I will serve briefly in Parliament between 92 and 97. Two people stood out for me in illustrating the importance of what you, Professor Jack Hayden, said. Uh, one was Gareth Wardell, who was chairman of the Wealth Select Committee, on which I served. He was an outstanding chairman of the Select Committee, although he wasn't elected, of course, in those days. No. Further their careers as backbenchers, or whether they're determined to climb the greasy ministerial pole. 
Yes. But the actual question I want to ask, sorry, is um, although you look very effectively at inward reform, it does seem to me that in a way we're moving the deck chairs because we have devolved power to Scotland and Wales and we've handed over power time and time again to Brussels and really Parliament is not what it was for those reasons. Right. OK, well, let me uh, take each of these in turn. Do I feel greatly concerned? I mean, there's a sort of analogy between the first question and the third, at least in part, by the process of devolution that Parliament, and Westminster in particular, will become less relevant. I mean, I confess that I don't. I actually think you could argue that the unitary state is slightly stronger for the fact of there being some diffusion of power within it. In other words, if you're too brittle, if you're too insistent on centralisation, if you're too resistant to what might be desired change from key parts of your unitary state, the unitary state itself could be threatened. So, I mean, there were those who said, well, if you have devolution, it will encourage the forces of independence. Well, we'll see in Scotland whether that is the case or not. I don't myself think it's by any means certain or even likely that independence will take place, but we'll see. But I do think that there was a heavy demand in Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland for some devolved power. Do I think it somehow weakens Westminster? Funny enough, I don't, because I think that the Northern Irish members and the Scottish members and the Welsh members feel obliged to be present in Westminster a bit more than they used to be, in my experience, Partly they sometimes want to continue their local campaigns at national level and they are using us as a pulpit. But also I think they are conscious that there are matters which may be currently devolved but in relation to which they can make a national comparison with what's happening through Westminster's policies more widely. So they may have devolved powers in relation, say, to education. But they'll often want to use that experience to contribute to debates in Parliament about what happens across the Kingdom as a whole, and I don't think that's a bad thing. But also, I think that they feel that they are obliged to be present for great national debates on foreign affairs and defence. And I think there's some evidence that they are, on big-ticket issues, more inclined to turn up, notably the Northern Ireland members, than they used to be. So am I sort of gravely worried about that? I'm not. Now, as far as... And I'll come to the question about the Youth Parliament Amendment. As far as Walter's question is concerned. In a sense, I've said what I've said about devolution. Of course it is a fact that the treaties have conferred notable powers on European institutions ever since 1957, but in particular since 1973, as far as we're concerned. That is a fact. But I do myself think that this arrogation of powers to the EU is somewhat exaggerated. And yes, it's there and it's real, but I think that the idea sometimes put about by UKIP that sort of, you know, 80% of laws are dictated by Brussels is, is a monstrous and absurd exaggeration. There are huge numbers of issues on which Parliament still does have a very big and in practice the decisive say. So, you know, are we effectively shriveled? No. Last point to Walter, which may not convince him, but I want just to put this proposition, ladies and gentlemen, is this. And I know you didn't say this, but it's often said by people who argue that Parliament isn't, as you put it, what it was. People sometimes conjure up this image of the golden age when there were all these splendidly sturdy, robust, principled, independent-minded members of parliament who always used to tell the executive and their whips to get stuffed, didn't care for office, were independently wealthy and came to the house for hours and hours and hours on end, day after day, to debate the great issues of the day. Uh, this is, of course, um, like most of these notions of golden age, complete nonsense. There was no such golden age. In fact, in the past, huge numbers of constituencies weren't contested. There were rotten boroughs all over the place. And these great independent-minded gentlemen, principally debating the issues of the day in accordance with the dictates of their conscience, were doing no such thing. They were looking after their land, or they were going hunting, or they were faffing about earning extra money in the city, or whatever. They weren't actually coming to the House of Commons with any frequency at all. And as recently as the 1950s, which was far more a period of whip domination than now, there were two whole parliamentary sessions in the 1950s when not a single Conservative member of Parliament voted against the party whip on a single issue on a single occasion. Two whole 
sessions when that was true. And in the past, Labour members, frankly, in the 50s didn't rebel very often either. And when they did, it was usually on defence and foreign affairs, not domestic issues. So if you study Philip Cowley, you'll know that actually the end independent-minded MP is much more a phenomenon today than it was 50 years ago. More MPs are rebelling and being principled and displaying their consciences and so on. So, you know, I think that there's a balance here. Some of Walter's points are legitimate concerns, but I think there are some good things happening. As far as the Youth Parliament is concerned, you're quite right. I'm a big fan of the UK Youth Parliament. i just say a couple of things to you about it, if I may, colleagues. First of all, when I and Diana and various other people, hundreds of other people, supported the right of the UK Youth Parliament to have an annual debate on the floor of the House of Commons. I was delighted when it won and that right was established. I decided I'd chair this day of debates, and I've done so each year since 2009. A Conservative Member of Parliament, it doesn't particularly matter that he was a Conservative, but a Conservative Member of Parliament of long standing who's since retired came up to me and said, is it true, Mr. Speaker, that you're going to chair the debates of the UK Youth Parliament? <laughs> and I said, yes, that's, uh, that's absolutely true. I, I'm in touch. Let me tell you, he said, it'll be a complete and unmitigated disaster. I mean, I had to stand back my ears. Was, and, and I said to him, you know, why, why do you... I know what I'm talking about. I've been here 40 years and more. I've been here very considerably longer than you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> and I said to him, I'm sorry, I think you're completely wrong. And it's totally wrong of you to caricature and effectively trash young people in this way. They'll come, they'll be proud and pleased and privileged to come, and they'll speak well, and I predict you they'll behave better than we do. <laughs> and I know it's never popular, colleagues, to say I was right, but I was right. Now, I mustn't do what the gentleman here was grumbling about earlier, perfectly justifiably, namely ducking the main part of the question. And the question was, what did I think about the voting age? And what I would say to you is that when I was free to hold an opinion and to express it on the subject of the voting age and could be tempted regularly to do so, it was in support of a lowering of the voting age from 18 to 16, a fact which I feel obliged to reveal to you, both because it is ethically right to do so, and because if I didn't, there's a very serious danger that another key champion of this reform proposal, namely the Honourable Lady, the Member for Kingston upon Hull North, sitting in the front row, <laughs> would reveal it to this audience instead. She and I were co-collaborators on that subject. That was my opinion then, but now, of course, that I'm impartial, and other than when I'm let out to come to speak <laughs> at the University of Hull, veritably a Trappist monk, I offer no public opinion at all. Now, if you think I, it's, I leave it to you to consider whether I'm particularly likely to have changed my view in any fundamental way since I became Speaker. <laughs> Time for any more. Can we just take well, one last group? We can take a couple if you wish to do yeah. so, but I must ask people to keep the questions brief if they would. I'd say you, sir, and then you, sir, and then the gentleman at the back. Please. Um, if you are going to If I'm to enforce... If you're not going to enforce a rule that, if I think of this, ministers ask questions as questions and to all of the Prime Minister should answer them or should be offered a healthy opinion to hold the latest compared to other rules, would you be in the rule? Right. OK. And yes, sir. Sorry, you're saying you, you like the house to be reminded, or you don't like yeah, the house? I like, uh, I like the way they were actually okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'll import you to Buckingham. <laughs> Thank you very much. By the way, I, I'm probably sort of laying a trap for myself, but in relation to the person who asked me about the voting age, to be fair, she did also say to me, you know, if people could vote at 16, should they be able to stand for Parliament at 16? And I inadvertently didn't answer that. And I mean, I think logically the answer is yes. 
and I don't know whether that change is going to happen, there's no particular sign of it, but do I think that there needs to be a difference between the age at which you can vote and the age at which you can stand for Parliament? No. Now, whether it would be a wise or widespread phenomenon for people of 16 to be standing for Parliament is another matter, but do I think there has to be a difference in age? No. And as I say, whether a reform takes place on that matter and, you know, is for others to decide, but I hope I've given you some indication of where I stand on the matter. Now, and on the first of these questions, if I can't insist that ministers answer, well, is it really a rule that they should? And I think the answer to that is, well, it isn't a rule that they answer in the terms in which the gentleman here was complaining that they don't. It's simply a parliamentary procedure that somebody asks a question and the minister responds. I mean, is there a, a requirement in the standing orders of the House that the minister answers with a sort of textual approach of focusing on the specific point and required to give a specific answer. There isn't. It is a debate or an exchange. And there isn't a rule. If the minister simply refused to answer at all, simply refused to get up and respond, that would be a, that would be a very serious problem. But have we yet had the problem of a minister so shy, so retiring, <laughs> so emollient, so conflict-averse as to remain in his or her seat? There's usually a precedent for things, sir, but in my time I've not observed it. So I'm not in any way ridiculing your point. I think you raise an interesting point. But it isn't a rule, it's just a rule that they get up and respond. As to whether it constitutes anything remotely approximating to an answer is another matter. And the second question was... And you like the way that people are required to behave so that you can actually hear. And did you then have a follow-up to that? Oh, electronic equipment, I beg your pardon, electronic devices. Do I think that they'd be a good thing because they'd make Parliament more efficient? Yeah. And I'm very open to the idea of electronic voting, and I'm not here tonight saying, you know, we should have electronic voting. If you ask me, am I open to the idea? Very much so, yes. There are lots of parliaments and legislatures where there is electronic voting. There is an argument, there are always arguments in favour, and there's an argument against. The argument in favour is it would be much more efficient, divisions would take place much more quickly, we'd use our time efficiently and could get on and do other things. The argument in, against and in favour of the status quo is that, particularly on the government side, but not only, the division lobby is an opportunity for socialisation. It's a chance for members to mix with the most senior members of their party and perhaps to raise issues about legislation or even constituency matters with a minister by nabbing him in the division <coughs> lobby. And that is part of the culture of Parliament, which a lot of my colleagues find attractive. And I don't think it will be lightly discarded. But if you're saying to me, you know, in the name of tradition, do I think we have to preserve the existing arrangement? No, I don't. I think that the House should have a chance. I'm not trying to foist my views on the House. You know, the Speaker gets into trouble if he thinks that he's the master of the House. Yes, I, I'm in charge of order, but the, the Speaker's there to serve the House. You know, I have a view about it, which is I would be perfectly open to seeing electronic voting, but it's not for me to impose it, just as I have a view personally in favour of more family-friendly hours for the House of Commons. I would start earlier and finish earlier. But am I trying to impose that on my colleagues? No. A, because it would be wrong to do so, and B, it would in any case be doomed to fail. My colleagues of all, I think probably almost to a man and a woman, got a view about the sitting hours. And they're not likely to be influenced by me, so I'll go with what they want, but that is my own preference. As far as the use of electronic devices within the chamber by members is concerned, iPads and so on, the Procedure Committee voted, um, produced a report in favour of this, and the House decided that such devices should be able to be used as long as they were used yeah. without impairing decorum in the chamber. Now, that's really a question, if I may say so, it's really a question of manners. Uh, I'm sorry to say that today I complained at a member who, who, while heckling, which in any case she shouldn't be doing, was rather ostentatiously fiddling with her BlackBerry ch checking messages whilst heckling. So, you know, <laughs> a very eccentric thing to be doing, you know. And I basically take the attitude, if a member wants to use an electronic device discreetly, fine, but to sit right behind the minister, for example, or shadow minister for that matter, focusing exclusively on your BlackBerry or iPhone and taking not the slightest interest in the matter under discussion is, you know, I know that people do it now and again. It is, if I may say so, a bit discourteous. And it leads one to think, what's the point of the member sitting there if all he or she's interested in doing is focusing exclusively 
on the electronic device. So, yeah, within reason, but, you know, show a bit of regard for your colleagues. And, you know, of course, most of my colleagues are thoroughly selfless and unselfish people, but just occasionally you get someone who gives the fond impression of being exclusively preoccupied either with himself or, at any rate, with his gadget. And there was one last question, I think. Yes, I, be I beg your pardon. And yours? Uh, impartiality. Impartiality. Do I find that a problem? No, uh, in short, for two reasons. I mean, it's a challenge, yeah. For two reasons, I don't really find it a problem. First of all, because I had a training as a member of the Speaker's panel of chairs. I was a member of Michael Martin's panel of chairs for four years before I was elected Speaker, in which capacity I chaired a number of bill committees in committee rooms upstairs, the draft, you know, the company law reform bill, or and many others. And you chair debates in Westminster Hall in the subsidiary chamber of the House. So I got experience for four years of having to be impartial and you know, I was, I used to say to people, look, I'm in this capacity the leader of the good order and fair play party. I'm not on anybody's side otherwise. So I got that training. But the second reason why, for me, I don't find it particularly difficult is that it's not exactly a great secret that for some years before I was elected speaker, I was, I think, the most liberal member of my party. I never wanted to be a member of any other party. I was a member of the Conservative Party for 29 years, but I was a pretty liberal-minded member of the Conservative Party for several years. So I was in America last week and spoke at the Kennedy School of Government. I made the analogy there with John Anderson, who stood as a very liberal Republican for the presidency in, I think, either 1980 or 1984. I think it was in 1980. Well, John Anderson was a very liberal, very liberal Republican. And, you know, I was a very liberal Tory. I was pro-LGBT um, equality, pro um, gender equality. I was very preoccupied with the fight against global poverty and improving provision for children and young people with special educational needs and so on, which were issues, they weren't labour issues, but they were issues of interest not just to members of my party or even mainly to members of my party, but to be members of other parties. So I got used to working across the aisle, as the Americans put it. And I, I must admit, I got sort of fairly bored with the Punch and Judy show. I rather enjoyed chairing the Punch and Judy show, but did I particularly you know, enjoy the tribal stuff? No, I got very sort of hacked off with it, and I, I didn't really want to continue with it indefinitely. So I haven't found it very difficult. Now and again, I have a view, of course I do, on an issue, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to be dishonest with you. Do I sit there bursting to express it? No, because professionally I've trained myself, you know, I realise it's my duty, I mustn't. I, I mustn't, I must be fair. And secondly, I know that now and again I'll be let out and I have the opportunity to come to the University of Hull on the occasion of the celebration of the 50th anniversary of the politics department, which is a great opportunity in order to give my own views. I won't say who, because I think it would probably be unfair, but there was, I was very flattered when one member came up to me the other day at a reception. It was a Conservative member I'd always had good relations with, but he said to me, you know, John, you remember me telling you I wasn't going to vote for you as Speaker, because I thought that you were very opinionated, and and you would almost inevitably be biased because you held strong views. And he said, but I genuinely think I have been proved wrong. And you know, I, I just want to tell you that I didn't vote for you, but if there were an election for Speaker now, I would. And there, was a, there is a female Conservative member who was, I suspect Diana will probably fairly quickly guess who I have in mind, but there was a female Conservative member who said that, that I was most unsuitable to be Speaker because I'd had a track record of support for the right to choose, a woman's right to have an abortion. <coughs> And therefore, I was most unsuitable to be Speaker, because if ever the issue came up, that would bias me in the selection of amendments to the legislation and so on. And I tried to make the point to her at the time, unavailingly, although I think, to be fair, she's accepted it since, that you know, if that logic were to be followed through, no sitting Member of Parliament could become Speaker. Because obviously, all Members of Parliament have got a, a, hint, a background. They've all taken a position on things. The point about being Speaker is that you give up party politics, and you don't try to impose your view. The, view, the views I do hold passionately about Parliament are views I think I can legitimately express, and I've had great pleasure in doing so tonight, and I hope that in doing so I have not caused undue offence. I don't mind causing a bit of offence, but I hope <laughs> I've not caused undue offence. But above all, my main aspiration is not to have sent anybody to sleep. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen...
to me to um, close this evening's um, event. Uh, I was almost hoping for a while that there might be some rowdiness so I could call you all to order, but um, maybe, maybe I, I would have been pushing my luck if I'd have tried that. Um, I'd like to close by um, saying some thanks. Uh, firstly, I'd like to um, put on record the department's thanks to the Ferrans Trust for the financial support that it's given to this lecture and also to the other lectures in the 50th anniversary series. I'd like to thank in particular um, one of my colleagues in the department, uh, Sophie Appleton, who's done a tremendous amount of work in organising um, this evening's event. I'd also like to thank Leslie, who's hiding at the back, who's also supported us uh, wonderfully throughout all of the lectures as well. I'd like to thank our distinguished guests, and I'd like to thank you, one and all, for coming to join us uh, to listen to tonight's speaker. And of course, I'd like to thank tonight's speaker, the speaker. He, he began this evening by saying that he would have done his research before he spoke. And I think it was so very, very clear to us all that indeed he had done that research. But beyond that, he'd crafted um, a talk which I think has been a treat for us all to listen to tonight, and he's delivered it uh, in the most articulate of uh, fashion. So I would ask you to join me once more in thanking uh, John Berko for this evening's lecture. Thank you very much.